Welcome to LT TV Weekly, episode 15. We made it. Jordan, we made 15. That's, I think that's syndication. Mate, I didn't think at the start of lockdown that I was going to be sitting here with you, well, sorry, in a different room to you, um, having 15 episodes of LT TV under your belt. I didn't quite get to the 15. I missed a couple, but I am. Um, that's very true. Yeah, well, but it's still been uh, quite interesting uh, for Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon. And the big news today, Geordie, of all the things that have gone on in the last 138 days of lockdown, postponed rugby, 200,000 views across our 15 episodes or 14 episodes. 14. So we're, we're over 200,000 views. That is truly amazing, Sam. Um, I think it's credit to yourself. Um, obviously, the spin machine. The spin machine is unprecedented times mate unprecedented <laughs> times people don't have a lot to do so they're tuning in to listen to you on a friday i know i feel bad for two hundred thousand eyeballs um geordie i would go far enough to say controversial opinion this week is the quietest week you've had in lockdown postponement i would say you're probably right i think the first week of lockdown was was reasonably quiet in that, yep. Yep. Um, you know, we didn't really know what was going to expect. And after that, it became quite um, crazy, really, with regards mm. to planning. And then obviously, we've been on a roller coaster since then. Um, the last month has been particularly busy. So, yeah, I'd actually agree. Uh, all field, um, it's definitely been a quiet week. It feels like it was all about rugby. Yeah, it's a, uh, almost like the season's on the horizon, um, which it is a couple of weeks out before our first game. But, um, you know, there was, there's been a lot of distractions uh, to take place, but, you know, full credit to the guys who've been training hard throughout, committed, and, and again, looking forward to the season getting started. I mean, training this week on the pitch, if you can look back, maybe it's my opinion, but tell me if you agree, it seemed quite spicy, I would say. Yeah, I think where possible, we, we tried to step it up a bit this week. Um, obviously, it's been difficult with uh, sort of, going through stage one in the first three weeks we were back we were social distancing training which um, was great for fitness but not great for rugby um, so once we got to stage two it was important we built up the loads and they've been steadily progressing again the weeks look very different we get tested on a Monday so until we get those clear tests on a Tuesday afternoon we can't do a huge amount but once we uh, we got the all clear um, which we've been lucky enough to do so um, we've been able to get stuck in and, and they be a little bit more physical in our training so um, you know, as I said, it's, it's, a, uh, it's been impressive to watch the guys go back to their business. And we'll hear from the new head coach in a minute who we got to speak to the media this week. And he enjoyed, I think. I think he enjoyed it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think he was probably a little bit nervous about it beforehand, <laughs> to be quite honest, working with you. But um, that's par for the course. Um, you know, he's been doing an amazing job on the field. And um, I think he's pretty clear in his messaging both on and off the field. And, I um, yeah, he's been great to work with him for the, uh, the last month as well. I want to ask you about one thing. Obviously, the international calendar has taken some headlines in recent days. Um, some changes there going into what will be next season for the Premiership. Yeah, look, obviously, we didn't have huge control over that. And, and that's been brought about by the necessity to, to play international games. So there's been some extra games put into the autumn window, um, which... Um, we'll obviously put bodies under a lot of pressure. Um, I think it's going to create different problems for, for the clubs and that we're going to have to manage the players um, probably in a, in a smarter way and really look after their bodies. You know, looking at the calendar, there is a lot of rugby to be played um, from the 15th of August all the way until next uh, June, July and, and further from some guys who play, you know, get selected for the Lions. So um, the clubs are going to have to be very smart about how we look after our players. The biggest news this week, Jordy. What are you doing, by the way? I'm showing you the biggest news this week. Oh, right. The new look kit. You're in blue, but usually you're in red when I see you out yeah. on the pitch. Yeah, no, the, co the coaches are in, in red um, and staff, so we can be distinguished from the players. Um, I had a round neck T-shirt, but I thought I'd stick a, a, a collar on for, for a, such a formal interview as episode 15. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, much anticipated. I think we were, we were um, waiting for quite a while to launch it. We'd seen it and, and we were... Um, conscious of, of what people were going to think of it. Um, I think it's, it's been received brilliantly. Uh, it's quality kit as well, so the players are really enjoying wearing it. And they, um, although you're busy trying to uh, uh, show me your inside-out hood, it's, uh, um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been uh, received well, I think. What, what's, what's, the, what's the lowdown on I that? I like this hood. Do you not like it? I do. I think it's cool. 
I think it's very cool. I'm more interested in the lowdown from the quality purposes. How does it, I, I know a couple of players commented to me and I, people will think this is all crap, but it's true. The genuine difference they felt on the pitch. Look, the, the, the quality in the kit is, is a, uh, I think it's, it's, it speaks for itself. You know, it, it, the guys enjoying wearing it. Um, it's, really functional uh, I, i'm gonna sound like an adverse for advert for samurai here but yeah the boys are loving wearing it um it's comfortable it's a uh, breathable um pretty warm day today so the guys were a uh, the guys were a uh, out there in the heat for a long time but you know they, they stuck to the guns trained well and um it's great kit that says sam on it so we can't lose nice there you go we can't lose the the big talking point is obviously one of the training kits which is very colorful a bit like the hood um, and, and the major talking point has been there's a photo of Dan Cole doing the rounds in it. Um, not a man that's necessarily made for the rainbow. I don't know. You know, what uh, It accentuates the paleness. He looks nah, like the wall no. behind me. Look, I don't, I don't know. I, I thought, you know, Dan can pull it off. Um, he's, he's a, uh, his like, complexion maybe is, is fair, but, um, you know, on the back of a bit of sun on his face, so I think he looks good in it at the moment. Let's talk about Coley quickly. And I don't know if I'm breaking the rules by saying this, but Coley got some stitches this week. He split his eyelid in half. How does that happen? Um, I think if you run into someone hard enough, that's kind oh. of the injuries that you find yourself. Um, so he's had a couple of stitches on the outside and quite a few on the inside of his eyelid. And they, uh, it wasn't pretty, but they've done a great job and pieced him back together. And he's, he's beautiful again. He's very happy. It looks like he's just had Botox. Look, Geordie... While we've said that's the quietest week you've had, the past month is probably the busiest month you've ever had in your life. I'm going to throw something at you here and I want you to stop me if I'm telling any porky pies, but let's go back one month. The club announces Blake Enever and Harry Potter have signed. On June 30th, it's revealed from external media that there is a, a deadline, if you will, for players to agree to new terms. The majority of the squad agree. On July 1st, you stand down five players. July 3rd, you cleared to do phase two. July 3rd, you announced Dave Williams is joining the club online. July 5th, over a couple of days, the club announces 20 or 18, sorry, renewals, including George Ford, Ellis Gems, Yaku Taute. Um, July 10th, Premiership Rugby announced the new fixtures. July 10th, the club announces the five players will depart the club immediately. July 13th, the club unfortunately, delivers the news that Taylor Goff is fighting to walk again. July 14th, Jordan Taufua confirms he'll agree to the deal, um, which is great news for everyone. July 16th, there's new kit and the infamous T logo is revealed. July 16th, the EPCR fixtures are announced. July 20th, you announce five new players, including a couple of internationals. July 23rd, Jasper Visa is announced. July 27th, the bright coloured Dan Cole photo is revealed of the new kit. Jordy, start me or stop me where you want in that picture, but that seems like one hell of a month. When you put it that way, yes. <laughs> Reading quickly and going through. But in all seriousness, it shows you, doesn't it? One, we are in unprecedented times, as cliche as it is. And I'm sorry I'm looking up. I've got it in front of me in a whiteboard. So the deadline and everything is all written there. But two, it shows you that, what? 30 days ago, everyone was going, Tigers are gone. They got no idea. They're done. What's going to happen? Now it's, God, we've got six blokes who are arriving soon, or five, I guess, if Lukey Wallace is here already. Jordan Tafu is staying put. Gosh, the new kit looks great. We're only two weeks away from rugby. It shows you how quickly the pendulum swings. Look, as you said, these are unprecedented times and we've had some things um, going on behind the scenes for a little while. Um, you know, everything had to come to a head and we wanted to try and get a line drawn in the sand in order for us to move forward. And, and that was obviously what we were conscious about doing. Um, you know, as you said, it's a very busy month. Um, but there's a lot of great people who work at this club who've been working incredibly hard behind the scenes in order to get a lot of these things across the line. And, and um you know, as you say, um, and, I, and I get it, I understand it when you, when you read things in the press about the club and, and you, you, you see, you know, things written in the media and the national media, you, you don't know who to believe. I think one of the best things that we've done as a club, you know, during this period is, is try to be as transparent as possible. I think, you know, this case in point, we, we get out, we get out in front of the cameras and, and we talk about things and having a brash Aussie as yourself willing to just, you know, say, ask the questions that many people probably wouldn't. <laughs> Well, look, you know, many people wouldn't ask the question, Sam. So I think you, we say, look, you've got 
full license to go wherever you want to do, ask the questions that the fans want to be asked, and, and we try and address them, and we, and we try and be as honest as possible. Um, it was a tough time. Yeah, 100%, it's a tough time. You know, there's tough goings on all over the world. Um, we, as one of the biggest clubs with the biggest fan base in, in the country, and, and if not the world, you know, 24,000 people we get to, to Welford Road, we were hit one of the hardest by this pandemic in that, you know, our revenue streams all stopped. So we had to address that. We had to get out ahead of other teams and we had to make sure that Leicester Tigers were going to come back stronger on the back of it. And the fact that we went out early and we made redundancies and the fact that, you know, we had to go through these tough, really tough measures um, meant that we were going to be in the headlines. Um, on the flip side of that, you know, we're out leading and, and that's a, um, an important thing to do on occasion uh, for, for me. Um, yeah, sure. It's been it's been a busy time, but it's been a really exciting time as well because you know the guys who are left behind have been amazing. Their attitude to training, their attitude to you know they want to play and represent Leicester has been huge. And um, behind the scenes, you know we've had things like Taylor Goff going on. But again, you know before we announced that on on the tenth of the month, you know we we had that news for we were sitting on that news for yeah. three four weeks, and you know there was things going on behind the scenes, ex players, current players. Um, staff, you know, getting together and, and, you know, just figuring out really how we want to look after Taylor and, and, and they, um, you know, do the right things by him. Um, so for, for everything that's been in the press, um, there's been a lot of positivity behind it. There's been a lot of meetings and, and planning. And uh, I think that's one of the things that I've been hugely impressed by. And, as you know, I mention it all the time. We've got some amazing people at this club other than yourself um, who work a... Uh, yeah, who work incredibly difficult, uh, difficult situations, and, and they um, you know do do a great job. Well, I think the point you raised there is I've missed the huge one off that list because I did go through announcements, so to speak. But actually, not only 138 days ago, but 35 days ago, there were 31 more people at the club working. So, um, you know, well done. You proved that I would miss some stuff out, but that is probably one of the okay. biggest points. That's all right. But look, that that was massive for us as a club, and and. Incredible. We lost. We we have lost some some great people. Some some you know legends of the club. We've lost some great staff. People who you know were desperate to stay, and and we just had to uh, um, make really tough decisions in order for the club to survive. And and um, you know some of the, the conversations that took place in around people who were leaving, who were made redundant, were just hugely supportive. You know there was there was quotes from people saying you know oh, yeah I guess it's really fair or feel really sorry for you having to break this news to us. And uh, um, it's it's definitely the, the toughest things that I've had to do is, is you know, break that news to people. It's, it's not nice, particularly when people are your, are your friends. But um, as we sort of said, it, it was important for us to draw a line in the sand so we can move forward. I think you saw the impact of the whole thing when you looked at the broken hair product or, or, or haircut that Matt Johnson had, because that was terrible. I know we discussed it last week, but you can't move past it. No, to be quite honest. And he's cut it. He has cut it, thankfully. I think um, finally, after the uh, amount of abuse we gave him last week, he, he managed to tidy himself <laughs> up because he was really beginning to scare me with his hair. But look, Matt's new to that role and he's probably been one of the busiest people during um, this entire 138-day period. Is it 138 days? I hope I'm right. I hope you are. I'm going to go with it because I don't know any different. But I'm going to say, you know, he's done... Um, He's done a serious shift in the, in the last 138 days and it's been really difficult for him. But um, he's a good bloke, despite his terrible haircut over, over a lockdown. And, and a, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're lucky to have people like him on board. I just like that he went from one beaver to another, but that's not important. I'll get a photo out of, for people to see. Look, you said the word scary there and I'm going to give you a quick break now because we talked about Steve doing media. Um, the chairman labelled him Prince of Darkness. That's not our words. Let's clear that up now. But the chairman labelled him that. I think when people see this, they'll start to understand what the chairman meant in terms of how he speaks about what he wants from people. Um, so here, here's what a couple of things Steve had to say this week when he spoke to the media. But I think certainly in terms of the, the signs have already been announced that aren't here yet. I think they will come and undoubtedly strengthen this squad and we'll have greater depth and greater competition places. And I see that as a real positive for this squad. I think everybody's, everybody I've spoken to is very realistic about where Leicester Tigers are right now and how much we've got to do to get, to, um, to get back to where we want to be and the time that's going to take. But secondly, I would talk about that there is, whilst there is a realism here, there is an expectation as well. And 
certainly I would much rather be involved in a team that has an expectation than has no expectation. And, and the third thing I'd say is, I, I go back to what I said earlier, nobody um, has higher expectations of me than I have of myself. And so I, every single day, I have very, very high expectations of myself and what I go and how I help this team. Um, in terms of your question about how we play, I think that we've got to build a style and a game model the way we want to play rugby in the way that we think is going to be successful for Leicester Tigers. And that's what we've gone about doing. So rather than focusing on very much the short term, we've gone about focusing on how we want to play rugby going forward. Very clear, every day I want to work towards winning. That's what we're here for. We want to work towards winning. Now, the realistic impression of where we are and what's happened in the recent past means plans have to be adjusted, amended, adapted, and then we move forward. And um, I talk to the players every single day about it's improving, absolutely improving, making sure that the rest of the supporters of the team, they are very, very proud of them. And we are very, very proud of the performances that we put up in the way the effort and the competition, in the way we compete. Um, I want us to win. I want us to win. I'm, I'm being absolutely unequivocal about that. Now, I'm not going to say, to, as we talk here, I'm not going to talk about time skills of saying on this day or on that day. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to say every single day we want to work towards that point. I think clear on, we should be able to see a very clear identity of how, how we play. But I think most importantly, and this is what has been said to me many, many times by many supporters in this short time with all the different messages that I have been sent, they want a team that works exceptionally hard for this to, for, to work together for this club. Um, they want to see that effort. They want to see that togetherness of the team on, on the field. Now, I think from, again, from all of the different communication I have had, I think people are realistic about where this club is right now. I, I do feel that. I think they're realistic about the amount of work we have to do and I think they're realistic about the time that's going to take. But the one thing they, they want, the one that I want, is a team that is going to work exceptionally hard exceptionally hard, have a togetherness on the field, a real collaborative one we do, and ensure that we are we are fighting for every little bit that we possibly can. So I talked about effort, talked a lot about effort here. I expect that my expectations are that we compete for absolutely everything we possibly can. And I think if we if if we are successful or if we fall short because we have worked exceptionally hard and we have competed. So we know we've got a lot of work to do, we know we're going to improve, and we know there's going to be areas in, in this period of time that we've not been able to concentrate upon, that we will concentrate upon in the further down the line. But if you want this critical, you go on the field, you work hard, and you compete. Jordy, before I say anything, um, I feel like watching three or four minutes of Steve makes me want to run full bore at Namani Nandola. Well, I wouldn't advise that to start, but no. okay, fair enough. I, th I think that's what that's what we get. Um, you know, we were conscious to add some real steel to a uh, uh, to the setup, and, and Steve as head coach has been amazing. As I said earlier on, to work with him, he um he he speaks and he's vastly experienced. He's coming from a great place, having obviously worked with with some great uh, great head coaches. Uh, he was really ready to to make that step up and you know the way he speaks to the guys the expectations the level the standards that he drives are brilliant and you know certainly um, just from watching the training sessions and you know sort of being in around it uh, it's been uh, really well organized really detailed and hugely intense and um, yeah the, the guys are really enjoying um, being out there and, and sort of putting it in for Steve. He to me maybe I'm wrong but to me there is a standard that you must meet as a player but there's also a standard that, tell me if I'm wrong, if this is the player's standard, he and the coaching staff are expected to constantly be one step higher than the playing group in terms of them. If they step it up, the coaches have to step it up. Is that oh, right? Yeah, no, definitely. As, as in the new Leicester way is, is you know, take the, take the best of old Leicester and, and add to it. And I like that if we're not trying to get better on a daily basis um, on the field and off the field then, you know, we're, we're cheating ourselves. So we need to, uh, yeah, as you say, continually improve, continually raise that bar and, and keep driving forward to, to get better on a daily basis. He is not a chest beating, um, and this is no disrespect, but he's not an Ian Dosser-Smith who will stand there and tell you the history and this. 
I know we'll talk quickly about the meeting that has been discussed in the media that I think Callum Green let out of the bag and we'll blame him because why not? He's not here. But the, um, he doesn't stand there and beat the chest. He's not um, to steal my own countryman, Michael Checker with a golf club swinging at your head halfway through a change room or whatever it is. But he seems to just deliver something in a way of almost like a, I don't know, a goodwill hunting psychiatrist who's telling you exactly what you need. Yeah, no, I think he's, he's incredibly honest is mm. what I see in him. I, I just don't think he has a, a, a... You believe it, don't you? You believe every I, single thing. I, I think that's it. And I, I think he's, you know, obviously he's, he's experienced enough. He's worked with some fantastic players. He knows exactly what he wants and he's honest enough to say it to you and, and, and to try and simplify it for, for the players and, and make it easy for them. Um, but again, drives really high has high expectations of the players, has huge expectations for him, of himself and the coaching group. And, you know, he's been, he's been driving that very well. I'll ask you about those sessions quickly. We mentioned it earlier. He seems to find his way in the middle of some malls and line outs and things as well. I can see him reaching over and trying to grab the nine or is there a little bit of Steve, stop. You can't attack anyone anymore. No, not at all. I, th- I think we've all got a little bit of that in us as a uh, ex-players. You know, want, they want it done right, and where he can add some experience to training and to, and to you know to get those uh, immediate responses, it's great. I, I tell you, you know, any time you have a coach on the training field, the, the players always want to up at a level, and they always want to make sure that you can't get up one up on them. So it's um, it's certainly a case that you know he 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 loves it. He he, you can see him when he's coaching. He loves being in amongst it. He loves the energy in the session, and they uh, you know the guys are responding well. I'm not going to say who or when, but in a previous life, um, a player was once dropped for breaking a coach's rib two days out from a session as a previous place I worked. It was hilarious. He literally dropped the player for breaking his rib because he did it in a sly way. Uh, That's positively encouraged here. I love it. Welford Road meeting, Jordan. It's out there now, so you're going to have to spill. What happened? Talk me through this Welford Road meeting that everyone's talking about. Oh, look, we, we um, obviously, during COVID, we, um, we were trying to figure out where we could have a meeting and, and they, uh, the, the best place to have meetings are, are out, outdoors and, and we figured the best way to do it and best place to have it would be at Welford Road where we could socially distance and put the players in, in a seats about a, uh, a meter apart and, and we worked off a big TV. But, um, you know, I think Steve had a presentation to, to, you know, put in place and it was his first meeting for the squad uh, and he had amazing presentation prepared and as we started it was supposed to be a bone dry day but the heavens opened and, and the, 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 it wasn't quite thunder and lightning but there was the heaviest downpour on top of the stadium which actually uh, just became so loud but um, Steve just adapted on the flow raised his voice um, probably as loud as I've heard it and projected and it um, just got a real buy-in you know the players they were forced to listen because the, the, it was uh, it was just at that level of, of noise but um, he just commanded the group incredibly well, and the, the words he used were, resonated very well with the playing squad, and, and um, seemed to get a great buy-in from from the get-go. Everyone seems to be talking about it. I mean, the four or five guys spoke to the media this week, and they all mentioned it almost without prompting. Um, for me, it's the young kids that keep mentioning it. Like I think there was a couple of moments where, uh, you know, player X from the academy has just come in, realised he was being delivered a message from Steve Borthwick and Jordan Murphy while he was sitting in between. George Ford and Dan Cole. And I think there was a little bit of, I'm here. I'm actually now part of this now. Yeah, look, and I think it was like that as well. I think, I think Steve Style is it certainly he's very inclusive. So, you know, those young guys were asked questions, they were included. And it wasn't a case of them being on the periphery. It was very much a squad effort. And, and you know, the unity that we need in our group is, is hugely important. And that's something that we have to drive going forward. And it was things that, that I am, I'm sure those players felt. So the, Spotlight now turns to you because you now have officially had one month as a director of rugby. Now, rather than tell me about your role and what it means and all this, I want to know what you've learned in 31 days. I've learned that if I have another month like July, I won't make a huge amount more, to be quite honest with you. Um, yeah, it's, as, as you said... You thank know, God for Burley's gin, eh? Yeah, thank, thank God, God for Burley's gin. No, it's, it's, as you said, it's been a tough, a tough month. Um, it's been a great month. I've, I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, I've enjoyed working through it. It's been great having Steve here on the coaching field and, and really sort of driving the rugby on the field because that's kind of taken a, a weight off. So I've been able to, you know, fully focus on issues off the field as well and, and, and look, at, look after those bits and pieces. 
Um, so it's been, um, yeah, I, I don't really know how I would have functioned if I was trying to plan sessions as I was last season alongside a, uh, all of the, the different things that went on this month. But, um, yeah, no, the, I suppose the, the biggest takeaway is, has been a, um, has been that just keep coming back with energy. I, I think, uh, people will always be very quick to write us off, but, um, we just keep, keep coming back. Does the director of rugby coach? Um, I have sat in on all of the, the, uh, the coaching meetings and, and certainly myself and Steve have talked about the sort of style of play and, and we've, 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 uh, agreed on the, the style that Tigers should have. Um, I'm doing limited coaching, I would say. I'm certainly helping out when and where I can with, with choice words, particularly to back three players, backfield backs. Um, but I've left the majority of the uh, coaching to the coaching team that we've assembled. So Steve, obviously, as well this week, was asked the question that everyone's very interested in all the time. Let's, let's be honest, because you and I have had a chat about this. The, people love to ask who's picking the team. That's everyone's favourite question. Who's picking the team? Now, Steve's answer was brilliant in terms of the fact that he went, well... I'll pick the team. I'm the head coach. But if it's the front row, Boris is going to help me. If it's the back three, Jordan and Rob Taylor and Mike. And like the, the, the uh, people forget there's assistant coaches. Yeah. But look, I, I think that's always the case for people. It's, it's, it's the big thing. Oh, who, you know, who, who's doing this? Who's doing that? Like we've, we've been uh, great. We've got an amazing group of knowledgeable coaches who work very collaboratively together, um, sitting down, talking through things, you know, posing scenarios, but what if, but what if, uh, and, um, it's been it's been interesting, but it's been that way throughout my entire time here at Tigers. You know, we've relied on the coaches to you know to assist the team. And um, when Steve was coming on board, you know, we had a discussion in around it, and, and you know, we agreed that Steve was going to look after the rugby on the field, and as such, with you know putting his systems in place of of which you know we want to play. Um, I totally agree that you know he should pick the team. Now he's he's a good man. He sits, he talks, he he takes advice. But at the end of the day, if it's a fifty fifty decision, he has to make that decision. Um, now that obviously puts different responsibilities on my my table in, in our answer to the development of players and you know how we get guys through and how we continually grow and develop the, you know that younger group and um, how we keep the, the club on a path of, of a uh, success down the line um, so yeah no I, I think that if you're coaching the team that's the, that's the responsibility of the head coach well as if like magic you've segued perfectly into where I want to take this because the bloke who's charged with that is you, but then there is three young men or four, I guess, in terms of when I say young men, they're not that young. Let's just be honest. But uh, yeah, young compared to you. Um, you've got <laughs> you've got David Wilkes, Matt Smith, Tom Harrison, and Greg Mannion. Uh, four young men. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Young younger men. Young men. Young men. Maybe not Wilksy. Um, not important. You've got four blokes who are charged with looking after the academy. One of those is Matt Smith. Now, Tom Harrison and Matt Smith, have I've seen them in a distance watching things or learning throughout this period. Uh, Matt Smith, though, was effectively not hands-on, but bouncing around and seems to be a sponge almost, trying to soak up what he can. Yeah, look, well, one of the things, both of those guys have been on furlough for a little while. Um, they have been in at Oval Park. And one of the things that we were conscious of whilst they were on furlough is that they could, you know, develop and, and personally develop over that period. Um, so to have them in listening, watching and um, floating around over, over that period was, was hugely important. Um, we, you know, we've come to a stage now um, where actually we've, we've taken both of those guys off furlough this week. So they've been in, been in around coaching uh, um, and implementing some of the, the things that they've kind of been listening and watching over the course of the last two or three weeks. And, and um, yeah, you know, the, I think the academy is in really good hands. Um, obviously, we don't know exactly when we're going to be back up. Um, but those guys have been trying to keep in contact over Zoom with some of the younger players and, and trying to get those guys engaged. And um, there is a, an air of uncertainty over everything uh, at the moment, particularly you know, below premiership level. And we don't know exactly when that academy will be back up. But obviously, those guys are trying to prepare um, as best as they can. And um, their track record on the field speaks for itself. Uh, and you know, so we know we've got an experienced group in there and, and they um, will try and grow that group and, and you know, keep them progressing. Well, it took 15 episodes, but basically you've just intro the next section. So I'm just going to kick back and put my hood on because here is what Matt Smith have to say about his last month dealing with academy kids, dealing with his own kids. Matt Smith, mate, first and foremost, looking very 
ripe and excited in red. Talk to me about your new kit. Um, yeah, I don't mind the red actually. It's um, yeah, summarise. Do some good kit. Um, Terry Sanders obviously um, knows his stuff. Um, no, it's, it's it's comfortable. Doesn't really hide the uh, the lockdown bulge around my midriff, but no, it's good. Retirement bulge. You had that prior to lockdown. Let's not pretend otherwise. Smithy, lockdown's been an interesting one for you because you weren't in season when we went into lockdown as the academy. But there was still a lot going on, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. We uh, unfortunately we missed um, an under 17s game, and the, that's where you kind of go into the, the under under 16s block. So those last seasons under 16s missed a bit of rugby. So hopefully, over the next month or so, we're going to catch that up. Your training is commencing soon. Am I right? Yeah. So tomorrow. So today's Friday. So the first of August. <laughs> tomorrow, Saturday. Um, and again, in the, in the current climate, it's kind of been constantly changing so now we're um we have to change the location at last minute but fingers crossed tomorrow we're going to get all 73 um lads um socially distanced in small groups of five so it's gonna be a busy day but really excited to kind of finally see the guys not looking at them on a tv screen so do the academy commence in phase one or do they drop straight into phase two like the senior squad or how does that work so we're we're phase one so it's small groups uh small groups of five plus a coach six um, no, no contact um, tomorrow. So ho- hopefully the next few weeks we can get into slightly larger groups. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a good challenge for coaches as well, coming up with sessions <laughs> to kind of uh, get the most out of uh, all five. You mentioned the TV screen. So what have you been doing with those kids? Uh, so the start of uh, July is when around we normally start a pre-season. So we try and keep as much normality as we can. So every Monday evening we've had Zoom calls, um, basically to kind of get to know them more than anything, but we've been, we've been dropping some good rugby details into them. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work around their IDP, so their individual development plan. So um, that's a big thing for those guys, how, how are we gonna make them better? Um, what does better kind of look like? Um, so th- those, those conversations have been really good over, over the last month. Um, and I, it's nice to actually, like I say, finally, hopefully tomorrow see them in person. You said 73. That sounds like a very large squad. Yep. Um, again, going back to the under, under 16s uh, block last year. So normally we'd kind of cut that 16s block down to a smaller group, but we haven't had the opportunity to, to see them. So it's it's fair if we give them, them all, all a fair crack. So um, probably towards towards the end of the summer, that number will get brought down. Um, but at the minute, that's kind of where we're at. So it's, um, it's, it's exciting, but hard work for everyone. Your coaching team lost a member, Dav Mele. I mean, we're not that we're looking back, but worth acknowledging Dav his contribution over the 12 months he was here yeah Dav, Dav was brilliant also I knew Dav from playing with Dav he kind of lived with me for about a month when he moved over um, poor Dav <laughs> poor Dav yeah <laughs> um, no it, it, it's really tough um, Dav, Dav was brilliant with the young guys with the, with the 9 and 10s um, getting a different uh, perspective of the game obviously he played a lot of rugby in France was was invaluable to those, those, those young lads and I know he still kind of he still wants to kind of help out with the young lads in a kind of more informal basis, but he's uh, more importantly he's a great bloke as well. So. Of those seventy three, was it? How many are returning title winners? They're all testing my numbers now. I'd probably say <laughs> around high twenties. Mm. So um, the guys that actually played in the final, there's probably around d- 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 maybe, maybe ten. So last year was. We had the highest uh, percentage of under-17s played uh, in the under-18 league. Yeah. Does that make sense to you last year? Yes. Um, so we're quite fortunate. <laughs> so season, we're in so. Uh, quite a strong position kind of moving forward into Academy the League this year, cause, um, and especially against Wasps. So we'd already won the league, so it was a great opportunity for those last season under-17s, this season's under-18s to get some Academy League experience. So hopefully that was standards in good stead. Have you guys had any confirmation or discussions around what the league might look like? Is there any conversation about it being postponed? Or are you lucky that it starts a little bit later anyway? Uh, they're ongoing. Yeah. Um, we're, in our mind, we're, it, the chances are it might get pushed back to January, but December to January, because we're still unsure around what the school programme looked like from September to December. So we're all pretty confident that there, there will be an academy league. Whether it looks the same format as last year is kind of still up in the air. I want to ask you about the school program because we spoke to Wilksy, as you were saying, last season, but this season or whatever it was, earlier this year, we'll say that, um, about the Good to Great program. How benef- Well, what is that for those that don't know? 
firstly? Yeah, so, uh, so ba- basically there are certain schools um, where we have uh, a link and an agreement with. So we go into the schools, help them with coaching. Um, they flip it over, they give us footage of their games as well. So it's, it's, a, kind of, it's a two-way relationship, so they help us out as much as we, uh, they can. We help them out as much as, as we can and stuff like that. Um, those schools, they've, they've generally got the better rugby coaching as well. Um, it, it's, it's a really good relationship. Um, and I think going forward into the school term in September, I think we'll be leaning on each other a lot more. Um, again, we don't know what school rugby is going to look like, so it's um, it's a good way to kind of strengthen the relationships. You talk about the school coaching. Your old man was involved in a school coaching program for years. I want more interested to know how much influence he has over your coaching now. Um, it's a good Be question. Honest. That's the first time anyone's ever asked about. Yeah, as a player, you always get that. I'd say he has more influence over me in my coaching than he did as a player. Because, like I said, well, he was a back rower. Yeah, he didn't and you're a centre. What's run, he going to tell just you? Run around, kind of trying to. Knock people's heads off. I can say it. You can't. Um, <laughs> no, he, so he's yeah, he's he was a school coach from from what when he was twenty two, twenty three. So that's probably forty years of coaching experience he's had. Although coaching is very different to what it did um, back then. But even someone to kind of bounce ideas off. Um, I found coaching it, it is tough. There are some days where you're like, wow, this is <laughs> this is tough. And as a player, you're, you're sheltered from that, which is which is what you should be. But no, he's he's a great kind of sounding board, really. Is there a technical conversation you have where you're literally going to him and going, look, I can't work out how to improve this at the ruck or approaching the ruck? Or It's not so much technical. No. It's probably more um, around the kind of delivery, kind of maximising sessions, uh, what has worked for him, what, why, what didn't work, why didn't work, all those kind of conversations, especially because he's involved with school rugby, which is a similar age group to one we're involved with here. Um, kind of picking what trends he's seeing in the schoolboy game, all, all those kind of conversations that are quite, quite lucky to have them, really. Well, I mean, people talk about Martin Johnson's changing room speeches, Dino's changing room speeches, Cocker's changing room speeches, but everyone says the greatest changing room speeches came from Dossa Smith. So does he have conversations with you about how you've got to rev them up, especially when it might be Saints this weekend or... No, I don't, I don't think so, because I've, I've been brought up on that. So that's probably one of my skills as well. Mm. Um, I'd like to think I can motivate um, the players enough to perform. Um, that's the kind of feedback I got from the playing group as well. It, but again, it's kind of where you pitch it. You're not the same. The, the first team level is not the same at the rate team. There's not as much. A few less expletives. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And obviously with the guys now, they're different generations. Like yeah. Generation Z is very different to what well, I'm a millennial. So we're kind of... It's, you Jeez, you're clinging on there, mate. Just, you're yeah, just yeah. a millennial. Um, <laughs> it's kind of how you how you maximise them and kind of motivate that generation to other other generations, which again again is interesting. There was a quote. Admittedly, I'm stealing from Australia here, so I'm sorry. But Wayne Bennett, the rugby league coach, had a quote earlier this week about a young kid who's in a battle for money and said that the current young kids coming through mature much earlier mentally, but not so much physically. So you've got to find a way to balance that because they think they're ready when they're not yeah. do you find that without knocking the kids it's not that they that they're arrogant but actually they might think they're physically ready to take on dan cole or a player like that yeah uh, yeah i'd agree yeah um and i i again going back to generation said i think technology social media has kind of played into that as well so they see they watch instagram and that's someone's highlights real they're not seeing all the hard work that's gone in behind that yeah um but it's pretty obvious when some guys kind of come up get chucked in against Dan Cole they're not ready no. um, but in a way that's a good thing because then that'll kind of give them encouragement to get better um, but it's yeah it's so how do you keep a lid on that um, what without in, giving away secrets what is in kind of how do you if, if if I'm player X and I come to you and I go mate I should be already playing A League and I think they should be picking me for the Prem Cup but I've played two academy games and I'm I'm good enough and I might be mentally ready, but you know full well that I've got a couple of years of hard yards in me and I've got to go off and have a crack in the champ or nat one. Um, what I find, um, again, kind of having that empathy with them, give examples of people that got pushed too hard too soon. Yep. And you, you don't want to be that. Um, you need to kind of earn your stripes first. You kind of get chucked into the deep end. That might be it. Whereas if you work hard, kind of put the hard yards in. With coaches, that's our experience. That's our skill. We, we like to think we know when you're ready. Um, but it's, it's difficult conversations to have. So do you think this period's helped you in that sense because you're not doing the 
physical work with them, you've probably had more time to focus on getting to know the person, getting to know the individual. Yeah, definitely. That That's the one, probably my biggest learning from last year as a coach. By far, you have to get to know this individual. Everyone is different. There's 73, 16, 17-year-olds will yeah. meet tomorrow. One size is not for all, and I think the more you can kind of tap into that off-field stuff, it helps on the field as well. Even those soft conversations, mum, dad's names, what A levels you're doing, what school you're at, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, you kind of that builds the relationship and that trust as well. So when I say run through the brick wall, they're probably more likely to do it because we've got that trust there. You mentioned mum and dad. Do you ever have the parent maybe thinks they're a little bit ready or a little bit further on than they might be in their um, own progress? Yeah, definitely. Again, I'm lucky. I've got two boys, um, and meetings around here is. The big thing I've learned from Steve is would you want to be coached? Would your son want to be coached by you? And I'd like to think my boys would. They wouldn't listen to me because no. they listen to me at home. But no, of course not. I'd like to think the way I coach the academy, um, my boys would appreciate that. So. You mentioned Steve. You have been involved in training with the senior squad. So you effectively got the three roles at the moment of dad, academy head coach, and assistant coach so to husband, speak husband as well don't forget that one uh, yeah well i'll let your wife tell me if you're a good husband that's up to her not up to you mate um assistant coach effectively you've just been well you've been basically helping out haven't you in a couple of different ways you were a pseudo rod taylor for a little while it's also rob but it's rod if you if you ask him how's that experience been what have you taken oh it's how long have you got it's, it's been pretty unbelievable I think the first weekend we were sat in a coaches meeting, you've got Steve, you've got Aled, both involved in the World Cup final, like kind of talking to each other about, I won't go too much into what they're saying, but I was like, this, this is unbelievable. Like they're two of the best teams in the world talking about ideas, what worked, what didn't work. Um, it's, yeah, it's been a really kind of steep learning experience, but I've learned a huge, huge amount, um, kind of picking their brains because they're from different environments. Rob, or Rod if you want to call him Rod as well, <laughs> Coming from different environments as well, just kind of a fresh thinking on the game is for me as a young coach has, has been invaluable. So for fans watching, because you're not that long retired, what is it now? Eighteen months or, or so long, or might be a bit long. You look you look yeah, awful. I've Let's aged, clear that yeah, up. I've but aged, yeah. you, if you were a player in this group, we talked about if your son would want to be coached by you. If you were a player in this group, how would you feel, or how have you felt? Maybe the players have felt in this environment currently. A bit just excited. Yeah. It's like it's refreshing, it's exciting, um, a totally different take on it. Um, and th- those guys come with that instant respect as well. So if uh, these players are going to listen, they're going to buy into the, the really kind of key, simple messages as well that, that are coming through. Um, but I think it's, and I'm sure you get told this a lot, um, but it's really, it really is kind of an exciting time. And for me to kind of look in and kind of take as much knowledge out of that for the academy as well is, is hugely, hugely invaluable. Everyone seems to say a couple of key words, which are, I mean, clarity, standards are are really obvious and high. And then there's this constant reference to just tough and hard work. Yeah, they sessions you wouldn't want to be involved in as a player now, looking Uh, back. (laughs) And that's probably a positive. Yeah, during, no, like, look, the... At the end of the session, you look at the boys and they've worked hard. Like, I haven't seen them train this hard probably ever mm. um, it's they're looking fit they're, they're healthy but it's at the end of it they've still got a smile on their face yeah and that's the skill of uh, Steve and his coaching team is that's the way they're getting the, the messages across um, and it's, it's I can't it's, it's simple messages but it's it's so exciting and um, yeah it's I can't I can't wait to watch the boys play in that first game as a final point you're Tigers through and through and, and you love this place there's been a lot of conversations over recent years about a need for an outside influence, someone to come in with a bit of a, I guess, less baggage, if you will, not to be controversial. Steve and Allard, are they the, and, and you know, Rob to a point, but you, you, when you look at Steve in particular, is he that guy that you say comes in with the respect of what Tigers is about and knows the history and knows what this place is built on, but has he brought that kind of new look, new idea to what needed to change? Yeah, I think so. And obviously Steve, he's spoke, he respects where less has come from. He talks a lot about we need to take the best bits of the, the past, kind of bring it into the future, um, which again, as a player, that, that would excite me because you, you, Leicester is Leicester. You have to connect to the past. You can't forget what's happened because it's 
one of the most successful club sides in the world. So you, if you ignore that, that's just an elephant in the room. But I think Steve's very clever in the way he picks the best bits out. But it's it is a fresh start, um, and everything so now is kind of kind of looking forward with with like I say with the positives of the past. Thank you. Thank you. Jordy, um, we talked about Dossa earlier being a passionate man. Matt Smith is Leicester Tigers through and through, isn't he? Oh, 100%. Um, you know, obviously, uh, anyone who's heard his father speak, Ian Dossa Smith, um, can just sort of testify to how much he oozes passion. And, and it seems to have a, uh, rubbed off nicely on his son, Matt, um, who I'm very lucky to have played alongside. Um, I think Matt as a player, you know, had everything that was, was great about Leicester Tigers. Um, you know, I think he was hugely underrated and maybe even disrespected by people on occasion, but to, to see the, the tries he scored and uh, even his last game for, for Tigers a uh, season before last, you know, he was struggling with an injury and um, we had a couple of bumps and bruises and I think Matt was supposed to play about 45 minutes and they, uh, we had a couple of injuries and, and he stayed on and he stayed on and he stayed on and, and they ended up limping off with about 10 minutes to go. But that passion, that commitment, that toughness um, were or are all still a, uh, in his personality. And, and you know, he's, he's doing a fantastic job as head coach of the academy. Uh, and I think he's going to go a long way in the game. As a final point, I guess, on things, you are charged somewhat with the pathway now in terms of overseeing all of it, which includes the senior team and guys growing when they actually make the senior team. But you... When you have a guy like Matt Smith, you've said you want guys who are committed to the shirt. Steve said he's want guys who are committed to the shirt. Andrea, Peter, Tom, everyone said it. Um, from your perspective, is he the perfect man to tell you who is actually committed to the shirt? Yeah, look, we, we've got some fantastic people. You know, part and parcel of, of me being in the position that I'm in is, is I wanted to get the very best people in the room, in, in each room. And that was part and parcel of, you know, why we went and got Steve Borthwick, part and parcel of why we went to got Rob Taylor. We're confident that my my board on defence and Brett and Boris, you know, are, are fantastic coaches. I mean, that first team setup, and, and I think that mix in, in the academy setup is great. You know, with Matt, with Jay, um, David, and a, uh, with Tom and and a, uh, Greg, it's a um, yeah, it's it's a good setup. You know, they seem to be getting the best out of those young men, and, and obviously that's hugely important to us. Again, challenging times with not knowing exactly when that academy setup is going to be back up and running properly, or as we know it. Um, so, but, you know, where every door closes, another window opens. So we've got some opportunities to, to try and develop those guys. So one of those guys making his way through is Dan Kelly. And I'm going to say goodbye to you for episode 15 because we're done. But here's a little snippet of Dan Kelly's first interview because he sat down with us today for a chat. And Jordy, unlike you, he doesn't sound Irish at all, despite claiming to be Irish. This is, this is what Irish people sound like from up north anyway it is what it is thank you for tuning in and to 200,000 views we're very excited um when are you going to get your hair cut you know what if they bump up the taylor goff fund if people go out and by the time we play if it's where put a number on it <laughs> what's it on 40 oh 100 so what, where are we at? It's on 40. Yeah. Two weeks. If it gets to 100 in two weeks, you've got to get your hair cut. Like MJ short. Yeah, but I feel like that's a big ask of people, isn't it? But if they do that, go for it. If it gets to, okay, 60, so we've got 60. If it gets to 60, I won't cut it, but I'll dye it. And you can choose the color. If it gets to 100, I'll cut it. So there you go. There we go. Time for get George Ford to cough up. Right. Anyway, Jordy, I will see you next week. Cheers, mate. Well, yeah, I, I suppose you, you, you've got that as you go in it to break into the first team, I guess, and as, as quickly as I can do that is, is the better. So, yeah, like I say, there's some there's some talent out there in the midfield and um, they, they put the push every day and um, the likes of Jaco, Matt Scott and obviously Mateus coming in, they've, they've, they've took me under the wing sort of thing. So, yeah, I think just if, if I do get the opportunity, just make sure I'm ready sort of thing. So, yeah, I'd definitely say I want to be knocking on the door. I, th I think it's just it's just a level up as, as as I keep going, I guess, and and the expectations they have and the, and the standards you, you you need to turn up every day, and I think I, th I think one thing is is what they expect off the park, not just on it, as in 
you're learning away from, away from the club. And I think that's that's the the massive difference is in the the hours you spend at home, making sure you're learning at home, so you come in next day and you you're uh, hitting the ground running, I guess. So yeah, the, that that side's been great. Yeah.